Um, all right, so I wanted to talk about a, um, a project that is um, been, it's been going on for a while. It was actually a, a chapter of Ron Smith's dissertation that um, Josh and I are trying to finish up. Um, and the, the overall uh, subject is the population genetics of transposable elements. So just to get us off the ground, I wanted to just see if I can get somebody to tell me what a gene is. This is a so test we're supposed to tell you? Tell me, just real quick, what's a gene? DNA that encodes a protein. Okay, um, so what fraction of the eukaryotic genome is coding for protein? 1%. About 1% or so, all right. Um, so what fraction of the genome then is non-coding? 99, I guess. 99 percent <laughs> all right now there's like g the concept of a gene is kind of like the concept of a species the more you think about it the harder it gets to really be clear what you mean so um there can definitely there's regions of the genome that can be inherited right and they're, they're important for phenotype but they're not actually protein coding and a lot of people would call those regions of the genome genes so can anyone just throw out a couple of examples of, of genic regions of, you know, things that are, you know, stuff that is important and uh, might be considered genic, but um, it's, not, it's not protein coding regions. It's easy. These are easy. He RNAs, ribosomal RNAs. Ribosomal RNAs. Small right. RNAs, small interfering RNAs, long non-coding RNAs. I could go on. Could Most go on. of our genome that has a regulatory element that actually makes some kind of RNA, way more than coding right. regions. Right. So, um, so that's that's very important. So when so that we don't want to like overinterpret this small number of uh, the percentage of the genome that's protein coding. Um, uh, a lot more of it is, um, you know, uh, uh, can be inherited in, in sort of traditional fashion. And there's also all sorts of um, uh, coding regions of DNA that aren't coding for protein, right? The coding for nucleic acids. And then there's also um, many regions of the genome that are important as regulatory elements, right? Where like transcription factors would bind. Um, you could call those genes those, and uh, you know, things like enhancers. Uh, it, it's really complicated. And so if we started to ask ourselves the question in what percentage of the genome is actually functional, right? So we're broadening our definition out. What do people guess here? Are we thinking? Define functional, please. Functional? Define well, it, please, and then we'll give you an answer. <laughs> is that a hard, hard thing to define? No, it, the answer will change based on the way you define functional, though. So functional meaning um, that it would be, let's see, how would I define functional? Um, functional meaning that it's a part of the genome that is important for the function of the organism. It's important for the, for the, for the life of the organism. I would say 100%, since we have this DNA in there, probably it is doing something that we don't know. I know Dr. Sai is shaking her head. Um, <laughs> I wanted to be a little sassy here because we don't know doesn't mean that um, the, the piece of DNA doesn't have a function in there. Maybe we just don't know. Right, that, that's always possible. It's hard, to, it's hard to rule out some unknown function. Um, but the, the, um, the, you know, the, 
so much of the genome is actually repetitive sequence. It's a sequence that can't possibly have any information content that's relevant to the function of the organism. Um, that I think most people would be hard pressed to, to say that they think that it's actually functionally relevant. But on the other hand, it is there, like Sadiq said, and um, the sort of uh, parasitic, or if you wanted to call it junk DNA, selfish DNA, that's throughout the genome, repet just, and if we, without those sort of uh, overloaded sort of adjectives, you could just call it repetitive DNA, right? Um, it's, uh, it's a huge fraction of the genomes in, in eukaryotes still. Hey, Greg, can I interject real quick? Yeah. Yeah, so, uh, so those of you who are interested, there's this paper um, by Dan Grauer called On the Immortality of Television Sets. And basically, there's this ENCODE project that, um, uh, you know, is funded by NIH, and there's like a massive push to say what's the function of every base of piece of DNA. And so they claim that something like 80% of the genome is functional. Um, and basically, in this paper, Dan Grauer kind of rips that idea apart and says that uh, based on estimates of purifying selection, only about 10% of the genome is actually going to uh, be conserved through purifying selection. Mutations in the majority of the genome aren't going to have any deleterious effects. Um, and he says, i.e., aren't functional. So he, it's a pretty interesting paper. And he really kind of, uh, you know, he's a, I don't know if you've ever read Dan Grauer, but he kind of can be a bit uh, in your face, but it's interesting. interesting yeah, he's great. He actually uh, shared um, his uh, lecture slides with me the first time I taught molecular evolution. Um, and you could even see from the lecture slides that he's sort of a character just from the fonts and colors that were chosen. <laughs> um, so could you share that, that paper um, with me, Josh, and I'll post it? And I just it. put it in the chat as well yeah. for the Zoom. Yeah. So, so, okay. So I think that that's, you know, that number starts to sound pretty reasonable to me, 80% maybe of the genome. It's not clear what its importance is, but it does seem to have, it is there and it, um, because so much of it, of the repetitive DNA is actually mobile elements, right? Or the relics of mobile elements, um, it, it suggests that, um, that they've had a, um, well, there's a number of reasons to think there's, they've played a major role in evolution, right? So um, for one thing, uh, if you have a mobile DNA element that um, it, it, it is a, uh, it, it's a source for macro, macro mutations, right? It's a source for a really big change um, in, in the genome that could be, um, every once in a while could be advantageous and selected for, and even if that's not happening, um, so if it's not if it's not contributing to the variation in populations that's selected for, um, it's still uh, it, it's still extra DNA that has to be um, replicated, and so it's going to be causing at least a little bit of. Um, um, uh, it'll be deleterious to some extent, right? Just because there's energy that's going to waste as you sort of continue to um, copy and, and have to work with this extra genomic sequence that's not serving any functional purpose. So there's, there's two major classes of um, repetitive DNA that potentially can mobilize. And one, are called, one class is called transposons. They're, um, they're, they're elements that uh, transpose directly as DNA. So we will sometimes call these uh, cut and paste elements. And um, if you, the, they're, they're very relevant to things like bacterial antibiotic resistance, right? You can, you can have an important gene that's actually moving around um, through horizontal transfer in populations, and that's sometimes happening through um, this process of the genes encoded on a mobile piece of um, nucleic acid, referred to it as a transposon. Retrotransposons are actually uh, 
they're transcribed in the RNA first, and then that RNA is reverse transcribed in the DNA, and it's the it's that um, double stranded DNA that's then inserted into uh, the genome. So people will sometimes refer to this type of mobile element as a retro transposon or a copy and paste, um, a copy and paste mechanism. So retro transposons have a lot, um, uh, some of them uh, have a lot of homology and mechanistic uh, similarities to viruses um, that, that go through the same process and will actually uh, enter a genome and be latent there for a long time. Um, so there's probably some connection between retrotransposons and viruses. Um, and, um, but there's other retrotransposons who, where the mechanism is, is different than that seen in most viruses. So both of the classes of mobile elements you uh, occur in um, complex eukaryotes, but um, it's these retrotransposons that are actually the most abundant. So here's this uh, distinction that we want to make between the transposons that are uh, cut and paste, where the double-stranded DNA is inserted, um, sort of leaves part of the genome and then moves and transposes to another part. And these retrotransposons where a copy of them is being made through an RNA intermediate, and then that's reverse transcribed and that double-stranded sequence then inserts somewhere else. Okay, so just colloquially, um, we can just refer to this as the uh, a cut and paste mechanism here for the transposons and a copy and paste mechanism for the retro transposons. Hey, Greg. And, yeah. For the ones that are cut and paste, how do you get more of them? Um, you don't. So there's a fixed number that can never change? Well, I wouldn't say you never, I mean, you, it's, a, <laughs> it's a good question. You, when, when, it, when it's a cut and paste mechanism, um, you, you know, we're, we're not thinking that most of the time you result, what the result is two copies, right? Whereas with the retrotransposons, that is what's being suggested. Um, Josh, do you have any understanding of, is it just um, that there's relics of um, sort of the leftovers that haven't been cut out when the transposition events happen? Yeah, so uh, you can increase cut and paste um, during recombination. Um, unequal crossing over can give, so like when the chromosomes align, you could have potentially things in repetitive regions where you have a lot of cut and paste, things could not align properly. That could give rise to more transposons in that region instead of being a perfect um, homologous or recombination, it could be slightly non homologous and that you could have uh, misalignment. Also during DNA replication, um, it's possible at DNA replication to uh, increase copy number um, based on errors. So you can sometimes get uh, replication of trans uh, cut and paste transposons using those two mechanisms. Okay, thanks. Yep. Thank you, Josh. So here's um, a little bit of the, uh, just give you a sense of how many different types of transposable elements there are. Um, and I guess one of the most famous transposons is the P element that's um, what uh, is, is um, very important in Drosophila. And the, a huge fraction of our genomes are these line and sign elements, <clears throat> which are retrotransposons. Um, I won't have much more to say about this, but because the, the level of resolution for the modeling that we're doing is really just the distinction between transposons and retrotransposons, whether the mechanism is cut or paste or copy and paste. Josh, is there anything that you would want to say about this um, menagerie? Uh, not right now. I don't, I don't think it's, um, I think for this talk, probably it's not necessary to talk through all the differences. So, so let's just talk about now what you might expect if you were to go into the field and actually look at a population that was um, 
uh, that was natural in interbreeding. And you just measured sort of the proportion of the, that you measured the transpose on load or, or the retro transpose on load. So the proportion of the genome that was actually these mobile DNA elements. And okay. so, um, and we're gonna call, uh, we'll, just, we'll just think of this as a count, that there's an integer number, like how many TEs of a given family are you able to observe in a genome from an organism where you've uh, gone out and collected it and sequenced a bunch of genomes from the field. Um, so uh, if, if you um, think about this in the way that people usually do in population genetics, where you focus on the gametes, the haploid gametes, um, then, then you might, we just sort of, we don't have to worry about the fact that the organism is diploid for the moment. Um, and um, you can, what, what people classically have done in the theory of transposable elements is they've suggested that, that they're going to think about this as there being pre-existing sites where transposable elements can insert. Okay, and this is a little bit of a dubious step to take, but it's, um, it makes things easy and to, to model, and um, it is sort of the first step in almost every modeling paper for, of transposable elements that you read. So if there's some large number of potential sites, so we're um, for TE insertion, and then each site is occupied with some small probability, then if, if all the sites are actually independent of one another, then when you sample, so when you, when you um, actually look at a particular gamete and ask what is the TE load, how many TEs are there, you expect that it would be binomial, binomially distributed, right? Where there's some number of objects and there's a success rate, right, P, the probability that any one of the sites is occupied. And if that's what's happening, then when you sample a lot of different organisms, when you sample a lot of different genomes from a given species, um, you'll, the, the relationship between the variance and the mean of the load within the population will have a prescribed relationship that's well understood. So the mean load would be the total number of insertion sites times the probability that any insertion site is actually occupied. And so this M times P is just gonna come out to be sort of the, in the, the site, the, the uh, sort of the frequency with which any given site is occupied. And then the variance is MP times one minus P. So when you do the division here, this measure of the spread of the distribution, that's called the Fano factor or the index of dispersion, um, comes out to be a number one minus P. And since P is really small, it's gonna be pretty close to one. But it's definitely less than one if, if you actually have the loads in the population binomially distributed. And if you have a whole bunch, many, many sites and they're very low frequency of occupation, which is what we sort of expect, then the binomial distribution is well approximated by a Poisson distribution and this index of dispersion will be one. So that the variance and the mean are actually equal. Okay, so now we're talking about the, when we, when it's important to remember that we're talking about the variance and the, the mean and the variance of TE load in a population of individuals, right, that were sampled and, and the genomes were sequenced. And when Josh, um, ha, uh, Josh, this is your uh, postdoctoral work, is that right? The actual lines? That's right. And w when this has been uh, more recently, when it was sequenced, um, and basically count up the number of transposable elements that can be identified of various types, um, you actually get, um, you, you can average over all the different lines that you're looking like and ask, well, what was the mean, right? What was the average load for a given class of TEs? 
And then you can look at over across all the lines and ask what was the variance in the load. Divide those two numbers and look at this index of dispersion. And what you see is it's way, way off from the line that would be associated with a Poisson or a binomial distribution. So the, the variability of the TE load in the populations as it is observed empirically, now that we have this sort of cheap sequencing that can be done, um, is the, the variability is much higher than you would expect if you're thinking about things in the way that I've described so far. Greg, can I ask a question? Mm -hmm. Doesn't the way you've described this model assume that the effect of these transposable elements is completely neutral? Yeah, at this point, it's a completely neutral model. We'll fix that in a second. Okay, then never mind. And it is, and, and what it is, um, and what I'm talking about is, is not meant to be uh, any innovation on our part. It's just the classical presentation of the population dynamics of TEs sort of goes along this, this, this is the argument that was made in the 1980s by um, Brian Charlesworth and coworkers, and it's persisted <laughs> um, in the textbooks anyway. And maybe just Good. one note about this population, just for those of you who enter. So these 100, <clears throat> 164 individuals were randomly sampled from one large natural population. Um, had quite like had about 100,000 individuals in it. So basically, we just randomly sampled uh, natural observed variation in the, that population. So it's not across the entire species, but it's more of thinking about this one interbreeding population. Yes. And that same is true for the Drosophila, the, the open symbols down here that um, are actually uh, uh, analysis that Ron did on a Drosophila data set from it. Um, an inbreeding population, an inbred, inbred lines from a from a natural population, not natural, but yeah, those are Trudy McKay's lines from like the NC State uh, farmers market. So it was a natural population originally, but then the lines are inbred; they become homozygous, and then you sequence. Is that right? Yeah, uh, yeah. They basically just went out to this farmers market and kind of just captured the genetic diversity present in this farmer's market and used that to the, as the basis for a, a lab population. So e even in, in that case, it's not necessarily as pronounced, but it, it's also the case there that the, that the variance in the population distribution of the transposable element load is way, way higher than the classical model um, would suggest. And this is a, a breakdown of that data when, um, that I think gives a little bit more insight into what we're really talking about. So if you look at the blue um, column here, we're talking about the cut and paste types of transposable elements in this population of monkey flower. And um, this, this um, going up and down here is the actual uh, overall load, right? The count for um, transposable elements of this type. So this genome right here had a relatively small count compared to this one up here, which had a large count. Um, and if you, uh, if you just looked at the histogram of all the counts, the mean is like um, 27,000 transposable elements. Um, and if if that were actually Poisson or binomially distributed, right, the gray curve there is showing you what the variance ought to be in the population. So the classical model is suggesting that very small amount of variance, but in reality, the variance that's seen is this, is kind of like this large Gaussian. Okay, so it's, mu it's extremely over dispersed. And that's, that's true for both of these species, for both of these data sets. It's true for the cut and paste, and it's also true for the copy and paste um, classes of transposons. So does everyone understand what I mean now by saying that 
the, the population distribution of TE count or TE load is over dispersed. Is that any questions about that? Okay. So when you start asking yourself, well, what would the possible reasons be for this over dispersion? Um, I, I guess this is, um, this is what the, the data is driving us to think about. Um, the first thing that you might ask is, well, the modeling was of haploid gametes. And, um, and, it, and, and so is the fact that the organisms are actually diploid perhaps contributing to the variance? Um, and the answer to that is probably not. If you have, if the diploid um, genome is actually the sort of the, if the load in the diploid genome is the sum of two gametes that are, um, um, that are together because of random mating, right? Then uh, these two loads for the haploid gametes are gonna be identically distributed and independent random variables. And you can just quickly calculate that the index of dispersion for the diploid population is going to be the same as the index of dispersion for the haploid gametes. Okay. So um, it, that's just a, a consequence of the independence of the loads within the gametes. And then the other, for, the other thing that you might suggest right off is that, well, there's lots of different types of transposons and some of them are probably less prolific than others, they have different properties, and so that in itself probably leads to a lot of variance, right? So that's another thing that you might think. But actually, when you think about it a little longer, um, let's say you had two families of TEs in, in the population, and, you, you, and one of them um, was this load N1, and the other was the load N2, and let's say that the index of dispersions for the two families was F1 and F2, <laughs> then you can do a little calculation. <laughs> and it, well, first of all, just from the definition of over what the dispersion is, you know that the variances were F1 times N1 and F2 times N2, right? And then um, let's, say, let's say that we weren't able to distinguish between the two families and ask what would, what would we observe? And the answer is that you would get kind of this um, composite index of dispersion um, that, that uh, is easily related to the indexes of dispersion of the two families in isolation. Okay, so the idea we're saying here is that it's this composite measurement that you're actually making, but in reality, in the background, there's these two different families and their properties are really different, but you don't really know that Right, and so the question is: Is this index dispersion f that's the composite value just large because of the difference between these two families? And the answer is that it isn't. So the the composite index of dispersion is actually like a weighted average between the indexes of dispersion of the two families, and so it's bounded by those values. And basically, if, as, as you think about it, you realize that the fact that the TEs are of lots of different types and might have different properties is not an explanation for the over dispersion that's observed in an experiment like um, Josh Pusey has done. And, and another way to say that, another way is you, you, can, you, can, you can look at the individual families here, right? And see that they're all over dispersed and you can look at them as a group and see that they're all over dispersed as a group as well. So you're, you're not going to see over dispersion unless there are families of TEs that have this property. It's not just a consequence of heterogeneity of T type. That's the, the second point to make. So once you sort of rule out those first two sort of trivial reasons why you might see the over dispersion, um, we're kind of left with, okay, well, what, what is gonna give rise to the over dispersion? And the approach that we're taking in this project, as you might guess, is to build a simple model of the population genetics that's a little bit more mechanistic than, than the classical model. And, um, and then analyze the model 
and let the model tell us which of these mechanisms that we build into the model are actually the ones that lead to over dispersion. The way that um, I thought it made sense to extend the classical population genetic models is to um, think of the randomly sampled haploid gamete, to think of that, um, uh, to just, just um, model the dynamics of the distribution of loads of gametes, right? So out there in a randomly mating population, there'd be some large number of gametes. Each one has a particular load. And so just sort of think about left to right here. This is a histogram of all the possible loads that you could have, ranging from zero all the way to every site being occupied. So that would be M. And then what we're gonna do is prescribe rates of transition between all these different states. So for example, if you had a load of N and an insertion event occurred, then you would be moving from state N to state N plus one, because you have one more transposable element. And if you were in this load of N and something happened that caused a transposable element to be excised, then, then you would move from N to N minus one. So this way of thinking about things is, um, is referred to as a master equation for this probability distribution and how it's changing in time. And what you, what you can do is write down an ordinary differential equation system that's keeping track of sort of the height of the histogram bars for every one of these possible observed states. So for example, if you're um, this rate of change of PN, right? Um, the two processes that I just described are two ways that you can lose probability from having a load of N. And you gain probability having a load of N if, 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 you're, if, if there's a member of the population that's in the state N plus one and then it loses a T, or if there's a member of the population in state N minus one and it gains a T. And so this basically the system of ordinary differential equations here is quite large, right? Because M is the total number of possible loci, but they're all coupled in a relatively straightforward way because you're essentially modeling a birth death process, right? And, um, you, and the, uh, the, it's, there's a clear relationship between how the probability must shift between all these different possible loads. So that's the form that the model takes. And then we're, um, in terms of these rates of transition, the, the model, the, the mechanism that, let's see, the way in which we choose to actually model the dynamics of TE um, proliferation and TE loss is very classical. Um, we're saying that the, the loss is going to be um, just a first order uh, rate. So that is that saying every TE out there has some chance of disappearing. And then the uh, insertion rate is going to be modeled as second order, right? Where you, you have to, um, there has to be an open site in order for you to insert into it. Um, and then the rate at which that can happen has two pieces. There's a piece that depends on the number of transposable elements that are out there. And there's a piece that doesn't depend on that. So this would be the, this would be the copy and this eta here would be the copy and paste rate for the TE proliferation. And the eta naught is the rate at which TEs can ar are arriving from sources that we're not explicitly modeling. So horizontal gene transfer or from another chromosome that's not the one that we're currently thinking about, that sort of thing. Okay, and now as, as for selection, the way that we are gonna think about it is just say that there's a selection coefficient that depends on the overall load. 
So what we're saying is that there's a, there's a viability for the organisms and that viability is going to be a decreasing function of the load. The more TEs you have, every time you have an additional TE, you're slightly less viable. <clears throat> and so now what we do, can do is we can put all that together into um, the master equation formulation. So you can see a couple things going on here. So one is the excision and the insertion rates are now explicitly in the ODE system. And then this, um, this term is representing selection. And basically what's, what the, the way that the selection works is that the, um, the probability distribution of gamete loads is going to try to relax to a value that's a little bit different than the current value. And that different value is, the, is, is, is something that you can calculate as an instantaneous function of the current probability distribution. It's just a simple um, Hardy-Weinberg type um, calculation of how these um, probabilities ought to change given random mating and given selection on the dipoid load. Okay, so selection is happening on the dipoid load. That's why there's two P's here. And that's why that's W sub N plus J, because there's two loads for the two gametes that we're considering. And this expression is, um, should be familiar to some people. Basically, the denominator is the mean fitness of the population, given the distribution of TE loads that you currently have. Okay, so without dwelling on that too much, um, what I want to do now is just sort of show you example simulations okay, of this birth death process um, with the proliferation dynamics and the selection uh, either occurring or not occurring. Okay, so this is a, what you're seeing here are the dynamics of that model. It's actually a, um, uh, it's a, um, uh, I'm not actually showing you the time dependent solution of the probability distribution. I'm showing you a stochastic, a Monte Carlo simulation that converges to the same thing, uh, just because it's faster for me to calculate. And, uh, and what you're seeing in the top here is the neutral model. So there's no selection. It's the neutral model um, where there's five, I think there's um, 5,000 possible loads out here and I'm showing the first 500 possible loads because that's where all the probability is. And this distribution that you're seeing here is the model's prediction of what the probability distribution of TE load ought to be in a randomly mating population when there's no selection and there's a, um, uh, a uh, proliferation and excision happening at the rates that I specified. And the important thing is that you look here at the mean and the variance and the FANO factor and you see you get this FANO factor that's just a little bit less than one, like I said, we ought to get. And it's the same is true for the dipoid distribution. I'm sorry, I didn't follow what's the neutral model. Is that the binomial thing you first talked about or is that your model without selection? My model without selection. Oh, okay. So your model and, without selection turns out the same as the binomial distribution. Yes, in fact, the, the um, yes, that's correct. Okay, okay so, um, if we, what I'm going to do now is, um, uh, show you still a neutral model, but I've, um, set this so that the, 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 the retro transposons are more active. So there's more copy and paste insertion as opposed to just, um, cut and paste. 
And what you can see is, um, as time goes on here, the Fano factor is growing, right? So the, prop, the di distribution is getting more and more dispersed. Uh, eventually, it's going to um, reach this um, analytic, this steady state that I can calculate analytically. And the same will be true for the diploid distribution, the Fano factor, um, you know, ultimately here is going to be around 10, I think. So what the comparison of this simulation and the last one is showing is that um, the copy and paste mechanism itself, if you model it mechanistically, can lead to over dispersion. So essentially, as opposed to the classical model where you assume something about the, the variance by, by assuming that you have this binomial probability distribution of, um, for, the, for the loads, here we're sort of, we're simulating the dynamics of um, the proliferation and and seeing that when when you have copy and paste transposition, you can get the over dispersion occurring as a consequence of that mechanism. And then um, here's a simulation that includes the selection. So in this simulation, what the, it's now the diploid distribution starts to become more relevant. This line, this exponentially decreasing line here is telling you the relative viability of organisms that have the various diploid loads. So if you're over here at a load of 200, you're about twice as viable as if you're over here at the load 250. And basically what the, this, this calculation is showing you is that if you don't have the, cop, the copy and paste mechanism, and, but you do have selection, selection itself is not leading to over dispersion. It's actually, it, it just, it's not creating over dispersion. Okay, so the bottom line of those calculations is basically showing um, here, here's a you know, figure that's gonna appear in the paper and it's basically showing you that um, these, these distributions where you have a large Fano factor, where you have high over dispersion are obtained by including the copy and paste mechanism. In fact, one of the things, this, this plot is showing um, the, the index of dispersion, the variance and the mean as you change this copy and paste rate. And what's happening is there's this sort of peak here in the middle where your index of dispersion starts to grow when the copy and paste rate is close to balancing the excision rate. Okay, so there's a, there's a there's a deep there's details in the parameters of these models where if they're almost balancing if these two mechanisms are almost balancing that's creating the over dispersion and the other uh sort of take-home message from the simulations that we've done so far is selection generally doesn't increase dispersion there you can find individual cases where it does but it's um it's it's uh that really only happens if there's a small number, if, if, if there's a very small number of uh, loci that can be occupied by TEs, and we don't feel that that's a very um, uh, realistic regime to be in. So, uh, one of the things that we're able to do is um, think about the moments of this of this distribution, right? We were, we're talking about the mean and the variance of the distribution of TE load. And so you can just set about the task of trying to derive equations that the mean and variance of TE load solve given the birth death process and the selection that we've uh, hypothesized in the population genetics. 
And so um, the, the moments here are defined as the expectation of the load to a certain power. And that's a sum over the probability distribution at any given time. You can differentiate this expression and derive ordinary differential equations for the mean and the and the um, for the first and the second moment. So this is the mean, and this is um, simply related to the variance to that equation up there. So what's cool about this is instead of having you know five thousand ordinary differential equations for the birth death process, right? you're able to do this analysis and actually just come up with a couple of equations that show you the dynamics of the mean and the variance of the TE load in the population. You can, this, this right here is not showing you selection yet, but we've done it uh, for selection. And um, I guess the only thing to say here is it's not gonna be easy to parse this expression. The, the, but the, the only thing to say here is the way this works is that you, without making any further assumptions, you derive these equations for how the moments evolve in time, but each equation depends on the next higher moment. So there's a bit of an art to figuring out how to stop the process and at some point um, do moment closure where you assume something about the higher moments and how they're related to the lower moments. And that, uh, that gives you like a self-contained system of ODEs. And then you can convince yourself that the closure that you chose um, works well by comparing this simple model with the full model. Anyway, so that sort of thing has um, leads us to be able to do some analytical um, calculations where <clears throat> we can sort of um, in a quantitative way say what the um, mean variance and in, in index of dispersion, um, how they're all related to the number of loci, the excision rate, the, um, the cut and paste rate, and the copy and paste rate. All right, so to finish up, um, uh, the main point is that when we sat down to try to develop a population genetic model that was a bit more mechanistic than the classical models to see if um, what mechanisms might lead to the observed over dispersion. Um, we found that it was this copy and paste proliferation. So the presence of retro transposons is, is actually um, uh, is in itself enough to to lead to the overdispersion in populations. And in particular, um, the, the other thing was that purifying selection on TE load does not seem to be generating overdispersion for the most part. Um, so I'll, I guess I'll open it up to more questions or discussion right now, but at this point, we're trying to write this up as a, um, um, as a paper to submit to heredity, I think. And uh, um, we have some thoughts about um, how to extend the model to include um, the sorts of uh, <clears throat> um, well, to include recombination. And I guess the, um, I'll stop sharing the screen. The, the thing about recombination is that on the face of it, recombination is actually expected to, um, to decrease the overdispersion um, because recombination causes there to be less, um, uh, it, less linkage. And the, the, the less linkage there is, the more things are gonna start to look just binomial. Um, on the other hand, if the recombination mechanism has this sloppiness, like unequal crossing over. And, and if you have phenomena like this that are potentially um, leading to um, large, like kind of instantaneous changes in the number of TEs, um, it's possible that that, that that recombination could be introducing uh, another mechanism that could lead to the over dispersion. So we'd want to look at that. And, um, <clears throat> 
I guess that's where I'll leave it. So thanks for listening. Any, any further questions? I have a question. Um, that was fantastic. It's a really nice extension on the classical model. So kudos to the whole team. Um, you started by saying um, this project came about because you made a biological observation. And so I wonder now if you look back and you were to look at the over dispersion of the cut and paste versus the copy and paste, do you see that the cut and paste are more likely to have the expected um, Fano value? Like, do you see a difference between the over dispersion of the cut and paste and copy and paste in real life? Yeah, so that's, that's a great question. So um, in fact, that's probably a better way to end things is to go back here now, right? And, and ask this question of, well, are some of these elements retrotrans, some of these are retrotransposants and some are transposons, right? And so well, what, do we, um, what do we actually see when you look at the families in isolation? And um, here, that's actually what's being done. These are the, all of the ones that are cut and paste mechanisms. And these are the ones that are copy and paste. And you do see some suggestion here that you have higher variance for the families of TEs that are, that are cut and paste, which is backwards, right? So what's so happening then with those? <laughs> Good question. But that's, that's in Mimulus, and in Drosophila, we're seeing what we expected. Now, we didn't, we, didn't, we, we didn't do this, not see what we expected, and then do Drosophila. We, we had all of the data, but then when you look at it this way, and you compare the two different classes, the, this, the, this sort of perfect story from the narrative of the paper would be, if they both ended up like this, where it was the copy and paste transposons that were more highly dispersed, right, within the population. But we're seeing the exact opposite results in, in Mimulus than we are in Drosophila. And so uh, I would say at this point, um, I don't know, Josh, do you have any ideas of why there would be this difference? Yeah, I, mean, I think there has to be something else going on. So I think what it seems like the, so we were inspired by this biological observation. The modeling suggests that copy and paste can lead to over, over dispersion. But then when you look at the real data, it seems like maybe like it doesn't necessarily match um, directly. So it doesn't say that copy and paste is um, the only way to generate over dispersion, but it could be a way. Um, and one thing that I think, I mean, Ron did some initial analyses of this is what we're assuming is that uh, that different TE loci are independently inherited. Um, so like the chances that you're getting one is gonna be independent of getting the other. However, um, you know, oftentimes, you know, in Mimulus and a lot of other species, you see TEs are in blocks. Recombination does a bad job. I mean, you also, and you see in these TE dense regions, recombination rates are low. So biologically, TEs are in recombinationally suppressed regions. So you might be inheriting TE as blocks. And as soon as you start things breaking non-independence, you're inheriting things together, that can actually impact your variance. Um, so what I wonder is thinking about a uh, recombination, not only as uh, unequal crossing over contrib contributing to increased variance, but possibility non-independently inherited TE loci could actually give rise to um, larger variance. So I think we don't know. Um, I think we can suggest a potential alternative mechanism um, and say, we've learned this thing about copy and paste and we'll go from there. I, I really like the, um, one of the things that's interesting is that the, um, you, uh, let's see, so you have, we have this index of dispersion, the Fano factor, and if the index of dispersion comes out to say 10, right, one of the interpretations of that, you can, you can do a little calculation and show, oh, well, I would expect a Fano factor of 10 if the TEs were actually moving around in blocks of 10 on average. So it's like a, it's a very simple kind of interpretation of what this Fano factor might mean if we're talking about um, this other sort of explanation that Josh has just given. So I guess the way that we would model that is that we would, we would be modeling um, our loci would be any region between two genes. <laughs>
and then you would allow there to be not just one TE or none, but any any number of TEs in, in the loci between two genes. Um, and then you'd have some um, uh, description of how often this um, these errors and recombination would be leading to a loss or a gain in the number of TEs in those regions. Is that what you're thinking, Josh? Yeah, something along those lines, for sure. Because recombination, I mean, is, uh, you know, uh, you know, we have recombination hotspots a lot of times near the start of genes. So that could, you know, genes are pretty well uh, mixed up generally. I have another thought for you guys. So you're still modeling um, transposons as being neutral. So the selection is coming from the number of transposons that an organism has. And certainly I agree with you guys that there's a cost to the number, but really each transposition event is actually a mutation that you can draw from a distribution. And you could say the fitness effect is pretty close to zero, but there are probably times, rare times when the transposition event is beneficial and more times when it's deleterious. And this would be a really hard thing to model, but I wonder if there's a way that when um, a gamete is going from one class to another, you could draw from that kind of distribution. Because my instinct is that there'll be times when you're just going to knock something out of the population, right? Um, because there was a deleterious mutation, or when it's beneficial, you get more copies along the edges of those particular things. Like it would be irrelevant to the number of transposons, but it could get some of those classes to be overrepresented compared to what you would expect based on this basically binomial process. So that's much harder for a future research, but I think that's the piece that's missing is that most transposition events may be neutral, but not all of them will be, and that could lead to overdispersion. So you would um, um, you would essentially be modeling selective sweeps that would be carrying some overall load um, with them. Um, if not a sweep, then the just an increase in frequency or decrease in frequency. And even if you just model it for one generation, right? You don't have to keep track of every yeah, single transposable yeah. element, but from one generation to the next, you might get multiple copies of something and lose one, right? based yeah. on whatever number you drew from your fitness distribution. Yeah, yeah, that's interesting. I have a kind of a stupid question. Are these two different types independent of the, each other or presence of one type kind of impacts birth and death of another type? I'm thinking of some phaselets with, um, with uh, help or helper phases where the help expression of another phase um, and that prophase kind of enters into the lytic cycle. That's what I'm thinking in my head. And I'm thinking of these different transposable elements. Yeah, so um, I could certainly learn more about that. Um, the, I do know that um, the, when they talk about the viral retrotransposons, what that is implying is that the um, machinery that you need to do everything is in, is actually part of, is coded for in the transposon itself. And then the non-viral retrotransposons are, um, my understanding is that there, there is, um, you know, they're, they're using reverse transcriptase or some other um, proteins that they need for the transposition process have to be donated by the cell. Um, so that's kind of the situation that you're talking about, right? That, that there would be families of TEs that, um, kind of needed the help from some other family. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's a really good question. I mean, I don't have any intuition about whether that would lead to more over dispersion or, or not. Um, You know, you for this that? assumption, we're assuming that the TE mobilization machinery is not limiting, right? We're assuming that, that there's not a limitation there because if it was a limitation, you could imagine, you know, you could get all kinds of wonky things that might be real, but we don't, we, we're not including that now because I think, I mean, there are definitely cases where TE um, can co-opt other pieces to use, you know, to move around, but I think it's hard to include that here in this model. I just thought I would add this as sort of fun. Um, industrial melanism 
in the moth, the sort of famous selection example is mm -hmm. due to a transposable element. So yeah. There you go, fitness effect. <laughs> nice. Nice. It's a fun example. And um, there's a interesting gender and science connection, right? Because of Barbara McClintock, um, just a great story of like her experience at, at Cold Spring Harbor. I guess Jen, Jen had time at Cold Spring Harbor, so she was familiar with the lore of that, of that episode. But her work um, with Maze, there's a really good book. Um, there's a biography of her called um, A Feeling for the Organism, um, which, is, um, which is highly recommended. I can't hear you, Jen. Nope. Well, Jen has something interesting to say about Barmo Clintock or Cold Spring Harbor. To unplug your headphones. Something or something. plugged in. Is this okay. working now? Yep. Yeah. Okay. Um, I can't hear you now, so it's a technological problem. Anyway, I just want to say I perked up the subject because retrotransposase activity is high in the nervous system, higher than in other organs, which is associated with schizophrenia and other diseases, but I've always said maybe it's why we're all such beautiful snowflakes, each one of us. If, if this rate of somatic mutation occurs quite a bit in the generation of 86 billion neurons, um, when you take someone's genotype, you don't really capture the diversity mm -hmm. that's in your brain. So that's always been something that I make my students read a little bit about it every time I teach my molecular neuroscience class. Has there been, uh, that's interesting, has there been any effort to try to look at, like, to genotype many different, to see the very amount of variation in the brain? Are anybody looking at that due to somatic mut mutations? I've read psychiatric, molecular psychiat psychiatry um, papers on somatic um, transposable elements and um, mental illness. So I had an undergraduate who, was, who, who did a, a literature search on that for us. Um, so I guess uh, everything that we're doing in our population genetic model is, um, the, is from the perspective of the gametes. And so there's nothing, there's nothing sort of somatic in, the mo in these models at all. But it is a really interesting um, question and potential application to, to biomedical science if there's a connection there. Jen, if you have any good, if you have any good um, reviews or anything on that topic, I would love, I would love to, to get a pointer to those. 